Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution? Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right. Welcome, everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where I talk with CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies and organizations like YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, OpenTable, Axe Software, many, many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And I'm excited today because my guest is Mike Michalowicz. He's the author of Profit First, Clockwork Surge, The Pumpkin Plan. We interviewed him previously on this podcast. He's back again to talk about his newest release, Fix This Next, by his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to private equity, another to a Fortune 500 company. And today he's running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. He's also a prolific speaker and author, former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal and former business makeover specialist on MSNBC. And over the years, he's traveled the globe speaking to thousands of entrepreneurs and he's here today to share the best of what he's learned. But first, before we get to that, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, which I co-founded with my business partner, Dr. Jeremy Weiss. And our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. And we do that through our Done For You podcast solution. I firmly believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast. Every company can be a media production company these days and easier than it's ever been before. It's one of the best things I've ever done, hands down, since I founded my business and allows me to pick the brain of smart people like Mike here today. So I really enjoy doing it and it's one of the best things ever. So I highly recommend it. If you want to learn more, go to rise 25 media. Dot com and we can talk all about it. All right, so as I mentioned, my guest is Mike McCallowitz. And, and Mike, before I uh, we get into it here, I also want to acknowledge our mutual friend, Michael Port, who originally introduced yeah. us years ago. HeroicPublicSpeaking.com. Go check it out if you want to become a better speaker. Uh, they moved actually only to a referral-only um, uh, business model. That's how in demand they are, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to give him a little bit of a shout out. I'm also active in EO San Francisco and the EO organization is a huge fan of your work. And I'm sure they'll be a fan of your work with this work uh, as well. But what better time, you know, this is April, 2020, we were recording this, you know, the coronavirus crisis uh, pandemic is unfolding at the moment. And what better time to come out with a book on the topic of what to fix next? Because I talked to so many business owners and so many right now are just a little bit overwhelmed with all the different things to focus on. So nice timing. I know you didn't <laughs> intend it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, the planting the virus was my, you know, pinnacle right. moment. Right. I know There's it's going to be uh, some, some uh, video of you in Wuhan, China. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know it, it's ironic. Um, it, I think this book will be of great service. I, it's sad though. I, I'd rather that we're not experiencing this. Just an article broke this, this morning that um, says this, this is the greatest unemployment rate we've ever experienced since the great depression in the 1930s Scary. and getting worse. Yeah. So, you know, we are in for some difficult times and s small business owners. The, the irony, John is, small business owners, we just got punched in the face, we got bloody nose, we're beat up, and the world in the same breath is saying, but you need to save us now because the backbone of the economy is us. Yeah. So it's difficult, it's crazy, uh, and I hope my book is of service because this is why I wrote it for this type right, of moment. Right, and, and you know, it's, it's hard for someone who's not a business owner to understand this, but I am so glad to be a business owner at this time. Yeah, it's going to be scary, but you know, you really diversify your risk that way because yeah, you might lose one client, two client, three clients, but you're never going to lose a hundred percent at once or rarely does that happen, yeah. right? Sometimes some industries, yes, absolutely. But you can pivot then you can switch to another industry. So, but the topic of your book is really what to fix and in what order and how to prioritize these things. And that is such a hard topic to tackle. So let's start yeah. with how did you, how do you even write a book on the topic of what to fix in what order that's gonna be applicable to a lot of different businesses. Yeah, so I found there's a common phenomena or challenge we have, I call it the survival trap. But what brought this about, the first thing was I emailed my readership and uh, this is about five years ago. It takes me about five years to write a book. And what I like to do is ask my readership, what's your biggest challenge? Because I wanted to, you know, the research to it. And uh, 
it was interesting because I sent out multiple requests in the same day and uh, people responded, the same people, John, responded with different answers on the same day. My biggest challenge is this, and the, and the same respondent had a new big challenge the same day. My conclusion is the biggest challenge entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. Yeah. So that became the thesis. And first, I, you know, what's the cause? And um, what I've come to call it is the survival trap. And you can, you can do this in your head or you can do it on a piece of paper. But basically, the illustration is this. You draw the letter A uh, in the center of a piece of paper and you draw a circle around it. And that A is representative of where we are in this moment, exactly the crisis we're experiencing, the challenge or whatever. Step two is you draw an arrow away from A, so from A going out in any direction you choose. And what that arrow represents is the way out of crisis. But now also step two, draw another arrow from A out in a different direction because that's another alternative path out of crisis. And you can continue this. You can do it five or six times. You can do it 100 times. Third step is now draw a B in the bottom left corner of that paper. And chances are you drew very few arrows or maybe no arrows in the direction of B, yet B represents the vital need your business has. So what this model uh, illustrates is that when we are looking at crisis alone, any decision we make that gets us out of it gives us immediate relief. The problem is it moves us to the next A, the next crisis. There's only one path, one direction we can take that gets us out of crisis or the challenge we're having and moves us consistently with where the business needs to go. So <clears throat> we really need to consider that point B and evaluate what we need to do before we start solving all the, 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 the list of problems that we are presented with every day. Which one is the one thing that we need to do most? Mm. That was the premise of the book and the understanding of the problem entrepreneurs have. Then I researched out the process to find that need. And what I concluded was ultimately what I've called the business hierarchy of needs. I've concluded that the DNA or the makeup of all business is about 99.9% .9 the same, similar to humanity. Like if, if you and me were standing next to each other, people could differentiate us by our height or our weight or our, our accent or our skin color. But if you peel back our skin, the biological makeup of you and me and all of humanity is basically identical. There's a reason if, if I was having like a heart attack or something and I go to the doctor, the hospital, the, the doctor won't say, hey, where do you keep your heart? Is it in your foot? You know, where's your storage <laughs> point? <laughs> it's, it's always in the same spot. So the, the triage process, the healing process, the medical process is always the same when you know the disease. Well, <clears throat> we just need to pinpoint the disease. And the beautiful thing is the inherent makeup, if you peel back the skin of business, if you will, is all identical. And so I created this business hierarchy of needs and I'll explain real quickly. It translates or it's similar to what's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs with one distinct and critical difference. So quick primer on Maslow. Maslow studying human needs finds that uh, the base need for all of humanity is physiological needs, oxygen, air, you know, uh, water, food. And those needs must be satisfied first. Once those are satisfied, we can elevate and address higher level needs like safety, protection from harm and shelter. And it goes up to belonging, which is community, goes all the way to self-actualization. But he argued that at any time, if a high-level need is not being met, we will automatically and biologically revert to satisfying the base that's being compromised. So if, if you and I are talking now and people are listening in, you can consider this maybe self-actualization. It's very, you know, it's intellectual stuff. You may be comprehending how do you apply this to your business. But if, if I'm eating a hamburger while we're talking here, and all of a sudden that, a piece, a chunk of burger gets caught in my throat, my biological response is to revert to immediately start coughing, to try to expel that blockage from my air passageway. Mm -hmm. That's how we work. Now, the business hierarchy of needs is similar, that if a base level need's not being satisfied, the business will start to choke or, or suffocate. The problem is, and the great distinction here, is in our own personal needs, we are biologically and neurologically wired into our Maslowian hierarchy of needs. I know, you know instinctually if you're choking. You know if you're walking down a dark alley and you get frightened or this feeling that there's going to be harm uh, thrust upon you, you better turn around because it's likely you will experience harm because we are wired instinctually. But we're not instinctually wired into our business. We're not biologically or neurologically wired. Therefore, trusting our gut becomes very dangerous yet that is the default protocol for myself for for decades and for so many business owners that i study 
is that we say, well, my gut says I need more sales. Or right now as we're experiencing COVID, the gut instinct is I need loans. I got to borrow money. But we're not investigating the empirical data behind that. You know, if, if my gut says I need money, I need a loan, there's clearly something not working properly in my business that's triggering that need. Mm -hmm. That maybe I should focus my attention on the resolution of that challenge before I consider a bridge or a gap or a bridging the gap or, or a Band-Aid with a loan. So just real quick, and I know I'm kind of soapboxing here, so I, I, I want to make sure that I'm- No, it's great. I mean, it's a great overview. Yeah. And okay. I think a lot of people are familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and the ideas behind it. So it's a great analogy, I think, for business owners. Good, but continue. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. So the translation into the business hierarchy of needs is it's a five-level model, similar to Maslow. Again, we're not biologically wired. So there's certain empirical data or questions we need to ask ourselves, but they're simple. The base level for all business is sales. Sales is the creation of cash for an organization. No sales, no oxygen. So it equates to oxygen. And if you don't have any sales, of course your business is suffocating. Immediately above that is profit. Profit is the creation of stability. And it's actually at these first two levels, John, that business owners already get confused on their instinct. Many business owners think that we need to sell our way out of a circumstance when actually profitability is being compromised, organizational stability, and therefore we need profit. So, for example, um, you know, we're, we're experiencing these challenges with COVID now. Uh, my business is losing clients. I need to sell fast is the response. But the question actually is, what is the challenge the business is experiencing? Are we experiencing financial instability or do we have no sales? Well, we have some sales. We're just not retaining enough cash. Well, that actually may, starts translating into a profit problem. We actually may be better served by cutting the associated cost with the sales we've lost to bring us back to short up profitability first and then revert to sales. So how the hierarchy needs works is we always start at the base, which is sales, and say, do we have an adequate stream to support the level above it? Kind of like building a structure. If we want to build a five kind of level structure and the base is the foundation, you don't put the first floor on top of a small foundation because yeah. it will collapse. But you don't do the reverse either. Like you don't build this massive foundation for a skyscraper and put a tool shed above it and it falls within it. And that's actually what we see. I see businesses trying to ramp up sales, hit bigger and bigger sales numbers, but they're actually putting more stress on the organization because right. sales is obligation. You have to deliver on those promises. They don't have financial stability above it. There's no profit. So one thing goes wrong, one project cancels, they're in the cash flow game now, that business is folding. So it works relationally. Mm -hmm. The other uh, three levels I'll do real quickly is the level above profit is order. Order is organizational efficiency. It's where the business does not have dependency on the owner to carry the business on the back. It's where there's linchpin redundancy. That the business is designed to operate as an efficient machine on itself and there is no dependency on individuals. It's dependency on the collective. The level above that's called impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is where our businesses are not focusing on the transaction. It's focusing on the transformation the transaction provides. This is where we start shifting people's lives, of being of service. The example I use is Harley-Davidson. Anyone can sell a motorcycle. You buy a Harley-Davidson, you now belong to a family. You're, you're a weekend warrior. You may get the tattoo on your shoulder, but you belong to someone. That's a significant shift in someone's life beyond the acquisition of a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And the highest and final level is called legacy. Legacy is the creation of permanence. And uh, as I researched out this, this was probably the biggest revelation uh, I've had in that when uh, a business is targeting and serving legacy, this is the day the business owner discovers they were in fact never a business owner. They were a business steward, that they've given life to something independent of them. It's actually about the business. It's about the it, the, the business itself, for it to live on and to be of service going forward. It's not about the owner themselves. So that's the hierarchy. Wow. And so it, it seems like what you're saying is you need to first think through each of these five pieces and, and then that will help you to prioritize which problem you need to go after next. Once you That's know exactly right. that you need to have each of these foundational pieces in order to, that makes sense. That's exactly right. And, and you yeah. always start with the foundation, just like Maslow, you know, there's businesses that say, I want to change the world. You know, not for profits are known for this. I, I want to be of such service and change right. the world. And we focus on the impact level, but there's no consideration for sales or profit, meaning contributions or maintenance of the company's fiscal health. And the business collapses on itself. These great ideas 
flounder and fall because it's this, we will build it and they will come mentality. And sadly, many for-profit businesses could be relabeled as not-for-profit businesses. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about, you know, in the context of COVID and what we're dealing with right now and all the different companies, I want to take a step backwards and ask about your personal experience, particularly the, the different businesses that you've run over the years. Did you have anything, you know, most people are saying that there's nothing analogous to this. And certainly it's seeming like this is the biggest thing since the Great Depression, 9-11, yeah. something, you know. Yeah. Um, did you go through other types of rocky periods that were maybe not quite rising to the level of this, but something similar? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since 96, mm. my entire adult life. <clears throat> and uh, I, my, my one business, I remember in 2001, what I found there's, there's a common trend in these situations. There's a trigger event. So 2001 mm-hmm. was the terrorist attacks, a dot-com bubble. Uh, 2008, you know, the, the Great Recession, they called it. That was the housing collapse. Now it's COVID. So there's a trigger event. And I remember in 2000, uh, was it 2008? Uh, or I'm sorry, 2001. In 2001, uh, when, as my business was struggling, I had 30 employees. I, I was in computer crime investigation. Hmm. And I told my staff, I had, I had 30 people. I told, uh, I think it was about 12 or 13 people that we had to lay them off. That was between, before the word furlough exists. Uh, and furlough and layoff and firing, the, the execution's all the same. They're just different terms. So I laid off these 12 employees. And um, I, what I said is I'm, I have to do stuff to be fiscally responsible to the business. I, you know, I think that was the right move. It was painful letting go people that trusted me and I trusted them. How long was it after 9-11 that you had to make that decision? Oh, it was maybe six months later. It was, maybe mm. six, it was pretty quick. I wasn't, it wasn't immediate, but it was pretty quick. Mm. And then I made the, a grand mistake. I told the remaining 18 people, I said, we still have to deliver on the same volume of work because our work wasn't changing. Um, but I said, what, the cash was changing, meaning clients weren't paying as quickly and stretching. So I said, I need you to continue to deliver this level of work and I need you to take on the work uh, for these people that we just let go. Jeez. And uh, I'm going to cut your salary by 10% because I need to save. And that was the mistake. I, I asked more of my remaining colleagues and as a thank you, I cut their salaries. In retrospect, what I should have done is made the tough decision to lay off two or three more people and then used some of those freed up proceeds to actually pay more to the people that I was retaining, a small booster shot. That's a, a really interesting strategy. Because actually, I'm hearing about businesses who are doing exactly what you did that are laying off people and cutting people's salaries and yeah. saying they have to deliver on the same. So that's an interesting yeah. approach. Yeah, well, here's how it played out. Those employees that I just told I'm doing this to be fiscally responsible said, uh, not out loud, but in themselves, they said, no, you're not. You just cut my, you, you cut my salary. You're not being mm-hmm. fiscally responsible because you're cutting me. So they yeah. all started looking for alternative jobs. And mm-hmm. as jobs opened up, I started to lose key person after key person. Mm-hmm. It was a fatal mistake. Mm. So better to keep their pay the same or to increase it and to cut a couple more people. That, that's what my experience indicates. Yeah. 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 Um, what ended up happening with that company? I sold it uh, to a Fortune 500, but it wasn't okay. like this. I didn't get the grand. I got a nice exit. I mean, it was a multi-million exit, but it could have been a much bigger multiple. And it was because I compromised the fiscal integrity of the company and I lost key people. Mm-hmm. I, I sold it um, later on. Robert Half International was our acquirer. And um, the the valuation was reduced because they, you know, they do what's called a recast. They, they analyze your historical, um, not your numbers, and the numbers don't lie. You know, yeah. we we compromised profitability. We were we lost key people, uh, and while our revenue was continuing to increase, we couldn't sustain the profitability, and so that that hurt us. Mm-hmm. And so, how do you approach this challenge now? Because you are a speaker and author, but you also have your businesses as well that you continue to run. So how, you know, going into this, what's your advice for other business owners, how to handle the challenge, this unique challenge? So, you know, the the business hierarchy of needs is what we rely on. And uh, what's interesting, I think it was maybe unique about me to some degree as an author is when I start writing, I start researching and testing the concepts on our own business. So we implemented the 
BHN, the Business Hierarchy of Needs, starting about four years ago actively. I actually have it right above my desk right now. And it just simply became a point for consideration. Say so all these things are happening rapid fire, we look at it. And uh, the, you know, when we have a challenge, like there's a decrease in some revenue, we uh, evaluate what's the cause and the trigger point. And the trigger point for us is simply prospects, that people are no longer inquiring about our core offering. So then what we did is a survey. And I think this is a real simple step every business can still do and uh, maybe should have done. We, we started five weeks ago. We surveyed our client list and said, how can we serve you in this new world order, so to speak? Mm -hmm. And the, the feedback was actually not ex at all what I expected. I thought it'd be more about, you know, give me some more business tools, give me more strategies about my business. Number one piece of feedback we got is I've, my confidence is shaken. I need confidence. How do I get confidence? Mm. So we said, okay. So we started the confidence course. We did a rapid development. We, we rolled out a, uh, a beta product and, uh, and now we're in full rollout this week to service mm. that. Mm. And we packaged it in a new way. It's stuff we haven't done before. So it's a, it's a cost point, which is reasonable for what our, our clients need, uh, but is, is acquire, they can acquire it. They can, they can benefit from it and, and it won't put them out significant amounts of money. Um, but it's also responsible back to us. Because I think, I think the mistake that I, I have made and I see business owners making now too is the other extreme. They're still in business for the moment and they say, this is my responsibility to give. And listen, we all have responsibility to give and serve, but not uh, to the compromise of the stability of our business. So to, just to care for others and not yourself means at a certain point, you're going to exhaust your business. And I'm going to see, I'm seeing some businesses already floundering to be giving um, and sustaining and they're going out of business. So we have a responsibility to do both, to care for our customers in the way they need to be cared now, but also still maintain that currency that there has to be a, a way for you to generate sales from that. And that translates to profitability because that's the only way we can sustain. So that's, right. that's how we're adjusting. Right, right. Now, for the companies that are out there that are listening to this, and you've outlined here the McCallowitz's hierarchy of needs. I don't think you're calling it that, <laughs> but I'm calling it that because it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that'll never make it, but thank you. Yeah, it's not quite the same ring as uh, Maslow's, but yeah, you Maslow's know. got a little better ring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but, you know, for those who are listening to this, the, that foundational piece of sales is obviously one that every business struggles with in good times and bad. Yes. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that for those businesses in particular that are struggling in this COVID-19 uh, world that we live in. Because you know, a lot of people are asking, should I be reducing my prices? Should I put some kind of inexpensive offering out there? I did a, a LinkedIn Live earlier today with my, my friend, uh, Kevin Waldron. And that was one of the questions that we got was from someone saying, should I have a, a lot less expensive offering that I put out there? Um, should I be pivoting and going in a new field? Your thoughts on, on sales? Yeah, so um, I do have thoughts. I, I, I feel that we have to do business as usual in unusual circumstances. And what I mean is our core competency needs to remain, um, but we need to deliver it in a new packaging. That's the unusual circumstances. You know, if, if you're a... I don't know, a business coach, and now you see the opportunity is making masks, uh, that transition is going to be tough uh, or impossible, and you're going to get run over by other people that are already versed in that skill set. So the question is, how do we continue to do coaching but deliver in a new way? The technique we use, uh, we evaluate, we did this to evaluate all of our offerings. We call it the one-step-back process. And it's a real interesting way to develop new products rapidly. Uh, here's how it works, and I'll give an example of a restaurant because restaurants are so affected right now is the end product or the final deliverable is where you start. So the final deliverable at a restaurant is placing food on the table so the patron can eat it. We simply ask ourselves, what happens one step back from that? And what happens one step prior is the, carry, the food's carried to the table or delivered to the table. Therefore, carry out or delivery is a easy option. And uh, some restaurants or many restaurants are doing this. Uh, I do see restaurants though amplifying it and that's where the real opportunity is. There's one restaurant in our neighborhood that teamed up with a uh, food delivery truck and the restaurant is packing the food, putting the truck and they're now delivering it to neighborhoods. And uh, so basically the ki the restaurants become a kitchen and the delivery outlet is the food truck. Great partnership, great collaboration, but we continue this one step back process. So what happens one step prior to carrying food to the table? Well, one step prior to the restaurant is the chef prepares the food. Well, there's an opportunity there. 
why not uh, record uh, videos of us preparing our 10 most popular meals? In include the recipe, um, sell that to customers. Why not sell them a cooking class where your chef is at the restaurant and now you have families or communities uh, joining in on a live cooking class to prepare your 10 or 15 most popular meals. And the beautiful thing is hopefully you know your patron list to some degree. You've been collecting emails so you can communicate and offer them. So they get to retain that core competency that they're your favorite meals. Now you're delivering to them. Well, what happens one step prior to that? Well, it's the procurement of raw materials, the inventory, uh, meats and vegetables and so forth. Why not procure that, divvy it up if you can still acquire it, and now you become basically a blue apron competitor, but for your local market. And then what happens one step before that? So the, so the idea is you keep on taking one step back, and the end product we deliver is really a culmination of many products along the way. So now we can extrapolate those mini products and make that our main offering to satisfy the new unusual circumstances. I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, it totally makes sense to not completely pivot into something completely new. But uh, you know, what I find, maybe you find the same thing, is that a lot of times business owners have been doing things a certain way, have kind of blinders on, and they can't see those possibilities. They can't see a different mechanism of delivery, but leveraging the same knowledge and expertise that they have beyond placing that food on the table in the restaurant the way that they've been doing it as long as they have. Do you, you see that as well? It's, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. It is tough. Uh, we are all victims of our uh, habits and established behaviors, myself included or in particular. So it is hard for me to break out of it. So that's why we use these tools and we typically, if we can do it in a group, and so if you have a team of employees, you can do it with your employees. If, uh, if you have contemporaries through organizations like EO or something, this is what your forum should be discussing is, is brainstorms around this. But I will tell you, if you have access to none of that, there is one superior tool that all of us have access to, and it's our, our existing client list. So there's some businesses, John, they're saying, we're, we're out of business and we have nothing. And I'm like, well, you may not be getting sales, but you ain't out of business. You have that client list of yours. Let's email them and simply ask them the easiest question ever. How can we serve you now? Your needs have yeah. changed. We're available for you. Just tell us how we can serve you. And uh, what you'll find is customers tell you. That's why when we surveyed our database, um, we were surprised. We got responses we didn't consider. I didn't think about the confidence, the need for confidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been able to respond accordingly. I think every business should do that. That's a great one. Um, I... I I've interviewed you before. We've talked about the profitability piece. I want to, we're running, you know, kind of short on time here, but yeah. I, I want to ask about the top of the pyramid, the legacy piece. And yeah. I just want to get your further thoughts on that. You know, you, you title that chapter, Sparking Your Company's Forever Legacy. Um, you know, give, some, give some, some context around that one. Yeah, so um, I'll give you a little story around it. Uh, the objective or of legacy and it's not necessarily for everyone. You know, this, the very top of the pyramid is a choice. Legacy is where you, you leave a business behind to continue the purpose it's been serving with the intention of it continuing on forever. It's, it's where the business is, is ultimately more significant than you or your contribution to it as a business owner. Um, the story is, is this guy in Guatemala City who I met as I was researching this probably about four years ago. His name's Phil Wilson. He was an expat, moved to Guatemala City, and uh, that's his country. He, he loves his people and his country. And uh, Guatemala um, has a very poor population on the outskirts of the city, and he wanted to be a service to them. Well, he created a product. It's called Echo Filtro. And what they do is they make these pots where you pour uh, contaminated water into it. They're clay pots infused with silver, and they take out the bacteria. And uh, he created it as a sustainable business. He sells it to the population. Uh, and has a model where it is a very profitable business. Um, well, the poor population, he just simply set up installment plans so they can pay it over time. But if you live in the poor areas of Guatemala, uh, you, you make probably a dollar a day, uh, U.S. equivalent, and with that money, you have just enough money to buy uh, some wood, enough wood to burn for the day, which you use to boil your water because the water is ridden with bacteria, and now you have safe drinking water. So it is a hand-to-mouth survival in, in the epitome of the definition. Well, what Philip did was he sells these pots, which cost about $24. So you, you're going to take a month's uh, pay to get it. But slowly over time, he'll, he'll give you a six-month you know, program where you're paying you know, 20 cents a day or something so you can eke it out. But the power is this. When you get one of these pots, 
um, you can pour water into it and you don't need to buy firewood anymore. So now you're paying 10 or 20 cents a day, but you're grossing a dollar, you're making 80 cents, which mm -hmm. is not big, but it is now forward momentum. So you're starting to increase your wealth. You're getting water that's, that's better. But here's, here's where his legacy is set. And he didn't even know it was coming. There was a, a community, a pollution uh, study that was occurring. Uh, it's a global study. They run satellites that called Philip and said, uh, we want to interview you around your pots. And he's like, what are you talking about? Well, they're running these satellites over Guatemala, and they noticed that the pollution was dropping um, mm -hmm. almost exponentially. The air quality was improving. And they said, we sent out a ground force to figure out what the hell's going on in Guatemala. And they said, we found that people are not burning wood anymore. They're using your pots. You've improved not just their financial uh, situation, you've improved the quality of the air. And uh, th that's legacy. Yeah. Philip isn't, the business is running on its own. Philip is, can and, w and ultimately will leave, but this has started such momentum, it ain't going anywhere. This is a movement that started in Guatemala and hopefully becomes a global phenomenon. But that's what legacy is about. I love that. That's so great. Um, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show a second time. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank We've you. been talking, of course, to Mike Michalowicz. You can Google it if you can figure out how to spell it. <laughs> M-I-C-H-A-L-O-W-I-T-Z, I believe, if I didn't screw it up. Pretty close. It's with a CZ, but I'll give you a shortcut. Oh, CZ, I'll give you a shortcut. You're right. You're so right. Uh, my nickname in high school was Mike Motorbike, as in the motorcycle. Um, uh, I never driven one, by the way. So that was my nickname because it rhymed. But if you go to MikeMotorcycle.com, it gets you to my site. All the tools and resources are there for free. That's smart. That's smart. Fix this next. Make the vital change that will level up your business. Did I get that one right? You nailed that. You okay. nailed that. Perfect. Okay. The last name, it'll probably take me a third interview with you in order <laughs> to get that right. But hopefully eventually. Mike, thanks so much. John, thank you, brother. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast. <laughs>